Welcome back. We want to turn to the Take Care of Maya civil trial now. Yesterday, the jury found Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital liable for seven claims against then 10-year-old Maya Kowalski, which included false imprisonment and battery. Jurors awarded the family a, t a total of more than $260 million in damages, but the hospital may not be out of legal trouble just yet. The Kowalskis are now filing a criminal complaint for sexual assault. The issue came up very early in the civil trial when their attorney, Gregory Anderson, addressed it outside the presence of the jury. I said, Maya, we're going to dismiss Ms. Beatty. Now, are, are you telling me every single encounter you had there? I need to know every single encounter, no matter how big or small you think it is. And she told me one story about them dancing around her to try to get her to get out of bed and dance. And we, we know about this. Then she broke down and then she told me that uh, she had a doctor come in and she figured it was a doctor because she described him as being tall, thin, glasses, I think she said round glasses, and uh, dirty blonde hair with a lab coat on. She could identify his belt and his pants. The doctor walked in, male, without chaperone or assistant. The doctor walked over to her and said, may I take a peek? The doctor pulled down Maya's pajamas this was pretty late in the day. Uh, I know it was short shorts or pajamas, but it had a drawstring. Uh, pulled them down, pulled her panties down, and then stared at her vagina for, uh, Maya said, long enough for her to, to be not only startled, but start to cry. Whereupon he turned around, went to the door, turned over around his shoulder and said, thanks. She never saw him again. Now, uh, as an officer of the court, uh, I will swear everywhere, had I known anything about this, I would have immediately brought to the attention of both the court and to opposing counsel. I then waited. I've waited for the past three or four days, however long it's been, because I wanted to corroborate before I brought this before the court. So. We, uh, be, uh, Maya was able to locate a witness where approximately two years, a little less than two years after it happened, she told a young man who was a friend of hers what happened, and he is willing to testify about it. Now, the defense argued the plaintiffs could not add that claim to the civil trial because it would require a motion to change the complaint and could push the trial back another year. Ultimately, the judge decided not to allow it in this case. All right, joining me now to talk about this huge development is the Kowalski family's attorney, Gregory Anderson. Gregory, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I want to congratulate you on your Michael? historic verdict. Number one, I don't think uh, there's very few people in the world who know how much work it takes for a case like that. And I, I would imagine last night might have been the first night in a long time you got a decent night's <laughs> sleep. So I, I think that's fair. So I I want to know how you and the family are doing now, a day removed from yesterday's historic birth. Uh, how we're doing now, I think there's a great sense of relief. I have a great sense of wanting more sleep is my concern. I've been operating on about three or four hours of sleep for the past nine weeks, so uh, I'm a little blurry-eyed. I apologize. The Kowalskis are doing very, very well. I had lunch with them today. They're in good spirits. They are very positive about the result. Uh, this was an unbelievably emotional event, but you know, they're kids and they had a, they have a great ability to, to, to recover far more than mine, I would say <laughs> far more than, than Jack's. So the, the Kowalskis are doing well and we talked extensively about the future and uh, some efforts to try to put their lives back together. All right, so let's move now to this new development. Um, I don't want to call it stunning because there was some inclination that this happened and was very damaging uh, to this 10-year-old girl right. when it happened. So tell me about um, this criminal complaint, where it stands and the decision to bring it. Right. Uh, well, I can tell everyone that today uh, Maya Kowalski went uh, to the 
Pinellas County Sheriff's Department with my partner, Nick Whitney, swore out a criminal complaint against Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital uh, with the idea though, and I wanna make this clear, that we have not been able to identify a specific perpetrator there. We do not know if this is a Johns Hopkins physician, though obviously from the description that Maya has given, that seems to be the, 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 the most obvious, but it could very well have been somebody who snuck in there, managed to get a Johns Hopkins ID, lab coat, stethoscope, the indicia that it was a doctor and, and, and perpetrate the crime. So it's important to understand that we, uh, Maya swore out a complaint, but we, 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 we cannot tell, and this is going to be up to the police really to the, the sheriff's office to come in and, um, and to conduct the investigation, make that determination. All right. So what does it mean for the case going forward? If you're not able to identify a specific individual. I don't imagine, at least in my experience, that you could bring this criminal case against, let's say, a hospital or a hospital administrator or someone else involved in the care of Maya, or is that possible? Well, that's a good point, uh, Michael. It's, uh, so it would be uh, a, a alternative allegation. On one hand, there will be counts, and we're drafting the complaint right now, and we hope to have it filed by the end of next week. On one hand, there'll be an assault battery intentional infliction count against the hospital uh, acting through a, an employee physician, somebody employed there. In the alternative, there will be counts involving premises liability negligent supervision, uh, negligent security, all of the, the, and I hate to use the term usual because nothing about this case is proven to be usual, but um, the, the typical causes of action that you would have where a facility, be it a hospital or a hotel or uh, wherever, uh, failed to maintain the appropriate security and protection for the the patrons, or in this case, the patients. So it'll be a two, it'll be in the alternative is the best way to put it. All right, quickly, let me ask you this. Uh, I am a defense attorney by trade. So I, I think in these terms, I can imagine already if someone is identified or even if the hospital, they would claim that something like this was what you do in circumstances where perhaps abuse is uh, suspected, that you're looking for signs of abuse. And that's what this was, not to discount the way Maya felt about it. But what would you say to that claim? Uh, well, in terms of signs of abuse, um, certainly what Maya described was in, in overwhelming abuse apart from this, and then this adds to it. It's difficult with children. Remember, Maya was 10. So a 10-year-old has well documented that 10-year-old's that uh, children are going to suppress their, their feelings about such things. And so um, how Maya reacted at the time, we still have a lot to, to discover and to figure out. If the question is, and I wanna, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm identifying the question, um, if it is how do we prove that as to the premises liability aspect of it, I think just having the fact that somebody was able to get into a children's hospital, and remember this was in the PICU, the pediatric intensive care unit. So how did somebody manage to make it into the PICU without anyone noticing them if it was in fact someone who was, was not a doctor or, or otherwise employed there than, you know, a, a third party assailant, as we say, how were they able to get there and get into Maya's room? An interesting point of this case, and if, if, if for those folks out there that were following the, the case just concluded, was there was a tremendous amount of testimony about the, 
sequestration, if you will, of Maya away from other patients um, and, and becoming a, lack of a better term, a non-entity there during her stay with, with no name up there, no, no identification outside her room. The other children had, you know, names, identifiers outside and, and everything from smiley faces to, you know, um, cartoon characters, things like that. Maya was not treated that way. Maya was treated completely as a non-entity. And our question is this, doesn't this tend to attract the type of, of perpetrator we're talking about here? If this child has uh, a, lack of a better term, reputation among the hospital staff as someone who can't be believed because of the allegations against her uh, of uh, factitious disorder, uh, conversion disorder, doesn't that kind of set her up for, for to be a, uh, a target for a predator? And that's something that we are we're actively reviewing. All right. Uh, un unbelievable. I mean, this is an unbelievable case that seems to have gotten even more unbelievable now. Um, Gregory Anderson, yeah. again, I want to thank you for joining us and filling us in on what could be next uh, in this case. Of course, we'll be keeping a close eye on it and seeing how that shakes out. Once again, congratulations on your verdict, and thank you so much for joining us here on the show.